Good afternoon, ladies. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the Claire Booth Luce Center for Conservative Women Luncheon. My name is Caroline Sear, and I have the privilege of interning with the Claire Booth Luce Center this summer. Um, before we start eating, I would like to lead us all in a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, we ask your blessing on these women. Please let our every thought, word, and action reflect our dignity as your daughters and grant that our strive towards excellence may always be motivated by our knowledge of your love for us. We ask this through Christ our Lord as we pray. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And then please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. My name is Julie Stewart. I'm the program officer at the Claire Booth Luce Center for Conservative Women, and we're so thankful to host such a lovely group of conservative ladies today. In case you're new to our organization, our mission is to serve young women like you and just help grow and develop y'all as leaders in the conservative movement and to promote leading conservative women. We do this through various ways. Some of those are webinars through COVID, of course, um, campus lectures and events across the country. Personally, I think my favorite event would be like a gun range event where we go to someone's college campus and just take a group of ladies to get professionally trained in firearms. It's a lot of fun. Uh, one of our biggest things would be our internship program in our office in Northern Virginia, just outside of DC. Uh, we have our internship program, and it's sort of not traditional in the sense that the focus is what we can do for you as opposed to what y'all can do for us when you guys are in the office. Our interns receive professional training from people who actively work in these fields, so they get training in media interviews and like best communication practices, public speaking, firearms, journalism, etiquette, constitution trainings. Um, our interns get experience in writing policy papers as well as just working with social media and then just events and things as they develop. So I just wanted to let you guys know about that. If you'd like to learn more about that, please reach out to me. You have my contact information in your folder. And if you didn't for some reason get a folder, please see me afterwards because that was an error on my part. Um, also, it's important to note that it is a paid internship and it is always in person. So even through different like COVID, we've been able to keep ladies in our office and just socially distanced. So that's been very fun and exciting. But now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today's lunch. It would be the Center for Conservative Women's, Conservative Women's President, Michelle Easton. Thank you very much, Julie. We have a lean and mean staff here. We have Julie and one other staff member, Cindy Rushing. Stand up so they can see you. Cindy, um, her daughter, yep. Her daughter uh, was an intern with us, uh, went on to actually to work at YAF after she graduated from University of Virginia. And, uh, and now she's a development director in a very fine, uh, a Christian school out in uh, Santa Barbara where she met the love of her life working for Yap and married and they have two children and a baby in the oven. Are we allowed to say that? One on the way. She's a great lady. Uh, Caroline Rushing and her mom Cindy. Well, I'm the founder and president of the Claire Booth Luce Center for Conservative Women and uh, I don't really need an introduction because I'm going to tell you a lot about me during my talk today. We've been putting on these lunches um, for decades now at the F conference. We love it. It's kind of a special chance just for the ladies to get together and sometimes to talk about things that maybe they wouldn't necessarily talk about if uh, the fellows were here as well. <laughs> and uh, I got picked this year, um, I think because I wrote a book. <laughs> um, almost 50 years after I came to Washington, seriously. <laughs> um, I wrote a book and had it published called How to Raise a Conservative Daughter. And it's become an Amazon bestseller. And Regner, yeah. <laughs> Regner Publishing has put it in order for a second printing of the book as well. And before I get into my talk, I want to tell you, we're basically out of books because so many sold and they're printing the second printing. But we saved some because I wanted to be able to offer them 
for free to you all if you want them. Um, on your, uh, oh. <laughs> In your folders as an assessment sheet, please fill that out. And at the end, if you want the book, clearly print your snail mail address, and we are happy to send it to you. If you want me to describe it, tell me what you'd like me to write. Or for somebody else, maybe you have a sister who just had a baby girl or something, tell me exactly what you'd like me to write. And try to write it clearly so I can see that. I'm happy to do that. Now, I thought I'd touch on four different things uh, today. First, I want to tell you about the bestseller book and why I think it's doing so well. I want to share some of the things I've learned in almost 50 years in Washington. I came in 1973. Um, I want to share some of my ideas based on my experience about how you can have happiness and the kind of success you'd like, both at home and at work, um, based on you know what I what I've been doing. I've had. I've had many blessings. I've worked very hard. I've done a lot of things right. I uh, had a great career, a long, happy marriage and family. Um, and I'd like to share some of that. And you can ask me questions about it, too. And then finally, we'll have, we'll have time for the, the questions. Now, let me start by asking, how many of you are working this summer in, uh, in internships? Raise your hand. Yeah. Well, that's how I started in 1973. It's a great way to start a professional life, even when you're still in school. I was out of college um, the year before. I had tried teaching. Where's Victoria? Is Victoria here? Yeah, Victoria. Don't get me wrong. I have tremendous admiration for people who want to be teachers. But I didn't enjoy it at all. Um, too many children in a small room, you know? <laughs> but you're going to be great. I know you are. Um, but you know what helped me decide that I want to shift from being a teacher? I founded a YAF chapter. My uh, last year, undergraduate, uh, Briarcliff College in New York. And my senior year, I got brave enough to bring in a speaker. It was tough. It was a very tough situation. Um, and it's even worse today on your left-wing campuses, uh, all the barriers that are put up uh, for you uh, bringing in speakers. How many of you have brought in a speaker or helped the club bring in a speaker? Yeah, it's tough, but uh, bringing it in, for me, it really changed my vision uh, of what I wanted to do with my life. It was so empowering to be able to, uh, I didn't have a big chapter, to say the least, but to be able to bring in a different point of view to my college. And, Putting on the event made me realize that, th that I wanted to be totally focused on promoting conservative ideas. I, I saw the impact I could have, and uh, I was uh, about your age, a little older maybe, and I had no idea what, what my jobs would be, but I knew I wanted to be where I could promote conservative ideas. And if you look at my resume in, in your folder, I'm a big fan of one-page resumes, so I've got 48 years there. On one page, you'll see that my first job, an internship, uh, turned into my first full-time job for five years. I was an intern at YAF, and I worked there the first five years uh, after college. It was Young Americans for Freedom then, and that became a part of Young America's Foundation. You might notice, looking at my resume, uh, that I did not have that many jobs. I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you a lot of uh, people think you just shift jobs all the time. I can tell you that unless a person is in an internship or a campaign or a political job, when you look at that 12 years of Reagan Bush, you have to keep moving in those jobs because you go to work for somebody and they leave and then you have to move again. But um, when I get resumes to hire at Claire Booth Luce or to help other people, if somebody just has had a job one after another for six, eight, 12 months, I hardly look at them. The truth is, once you're out of college and you're in a professional job, it takes almost a full year to learn the job, and that's when you start to be useful to your employers. So that's my first little bit of job advice. And so why did I leave YAF? I loved it. It was wonderful. Back then, there weren't many conservative groups. There was no clear with loose, for sure. Well, my husband became executive director of YAF, and he would have been my boss, and I love him dearly, but <laughs> I thought, it's time to leave. And so I went to National Right to Work, a great conservative group. And then I was doing my law school at night. I went through at night. 
Um, I had just gotten my law degree and President Reagan was elected and I went to work for him for eight years and then I stayed for four more um, for the first President Bush. During that time I had three sons and a daughter. Um, now, when you go into a, a presidential administration, uh, when the president loses, you know what happens? You get fired. <laughs> And uh, Bill Clinton beat uh, President Bush in 1992. He fired all the Bush appointees the day he was inaugurated in uh, January 1993. I'm a fan of so much that President Trump did, but he didn't fire them all, and he should have, because those people were a great detriment to him accomplishing things. So soon after uh, Bill Clinton fired me, that's a mark of, of, of valor, I'm proud of that, I decided to found this organization to Promote our great women leaders. We've always had great women leaders. She's nodding. She knows. But we haven't always promoted them. Whereas the left, with their women's studies programs and women's studies courses and their dominance in the media, they're always promoting much lesser women. So it was to promote our leaders and then to use them, to use them as role models for up-and-coming young college women like you. And I've been doing that for uh, 28 years. I share all of this to show you possibilities for you in your life and what, with a lot of hard work, you can achieve. If you read my book, you'll learn some more details about my life and philosophy. There's a lot of things that go into achieving happiness and success, personally and professionally. And I'm going to share some of it with you. Now, you're all students. You're mostly all in college, there might be a couple of high school. You picked a degree area, you're dedicated activists to come to a five-day conference like this. You're working hard, I'm sure. What do you think the most important decision you'll make in the next 50 years is? If you've heard this, this speech before, don't raise your hand. Anybody? Who, who you marry? I know not all women your age want to marry, but most of you do, 99.9 percent. And getting that right would be a great foundation for the rest of a successful life, professionally and personally. If you get it wrong, sometimes you can recover, but sometimes you suffer incredible soul-crushing heartbreak and, and you're never whole again. So please, get that right, would you? Picking a husband, someone who shares your faith and your values, is committed to a lifelong marriage through thick and thin, is a hard worker, is loyal, honest, and whose company you really enjoy as a friend as well as a lover. Don't wait and wait and wait, however, looking for perfection. Because if I would have told my daughter, I would have told my daughter if she had lived, we lost our daughter in heart surgery. The perfect man is looking for the perfect woman. So don't be looking for perfection. But if you ask me the number one trait, the most important trait a woman needs in a man, I think it would be integrity and honesty. And then the others are terribly important too. But don't fool yourself into thinking that having a good marriage is easy. I've been married 47 years and it's been really good. I'm truly blessed, but it's not easy. It's really hard work. And as you're getting into this, May I suggest that you seek advice from people who've had success in this area. There's one person in my family who never fails to speak up and give me marital advice. She's had three failed marriages. I never ask for advice, but she keeps giving it. My point is get advice from people who've had success in marriage, not people who've had miserable failures. But the things that are hardest in life, keeping a marriage strong, having and raising children, caring for aging parents, having a successful professional career, these things are tough and very hard, but they're the most gratifying things that you can do as a woman. So don't expect important things in life to be easy, because they're not. Now, why did I write this book? Well, over the 28 years, I've worked literally with thousands of young women your age. And I noticed some things they had in common when they were raised and what they did when they were growing up. And in this time of political correctness and woke culture, a lot of people, especially the adults who support our work, 
at Claire Booth Luce with their gifts were very worried about how their daughters were turning out, especially when they got to college. So I wrote the book as a guide for parents and grandparents, for anybody involved in, in raising young women. But I'm so happy that we're actually reaching a wider audience of women your age who've told me they've learned from the book as well. So let me share some of the key items in the book that might be helpful to you. The first chapter is self-worth flows from God, not government. Here's the thing. Can you be an atheist and be a conservative? Yes, uh, you can, but religious faith and freedom are inextricably linked. And I was so pleased to hear Vice President Pence talking a little about this last night. That's why totalitarian and tyrannical governments oppose atheism, because people of faith know that their self-worth comes from God, not from government. And this threatens dictators and tyrants control and power. Think about places like Cuba, North Korea, communist China. They torture, they beat, they imprison, they execute people of faith in order to crush freedom movements and to enforce atheism. The modern socialism that's promoted by President Biden and Kamala Harris and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, their policies all foster government dependency. And people like Bernie Sanders and AOC, they love to offer free stuff. They want you to look to government as a higher power, as a stand-in for faith and religion. As conservatives, as conservative young women, you need to talk about the relationship between belief in a higher being, God, and freedom. I think we need to talk about it a lot more. Self-worth comes from God, and that's quite different from self-esteem that many of you have probably heard about uh, in your schools, especially kindergarten to 12th, 12th grade. Self-esteem is a feeling of satisfaction with yourself. It's okay, it's okay. but. Self-worth is a deeply conservative concept. It's the greatest gift that your mom and dad, your family can give. And if you have daughters in the future, it's the greatest gift you can give them. It's the knowledge that every single one of you is uniquely made and unconditionally loved by God. Self-worth is a deep understanding of your value as a human being. And it, it places your value outside of the cultural forces and the government. Self-esteem tends to have you look to others for validation. You know, my sister was a teacher on Cape Cod, and the teachers in her schools were told, you must tell the children every day how awesome they are. And my sister told me, you know, they weren't that awesome. <laughs> but occasionally, when they did something that was great, the, the words were meaningless because it had been so overdone. Self-esteem is not the most important thing for you to have. Self-worth is. Receiving praise to make you feel self-satisfied, oh, you're so awesome. You know, everyone gets a participation tr trophy because you're all so great. It's a poor substitute for the much more important self-worth. So much of the left-wing uh, political agenda, affirmative action, government-funded health care, free stuff, that's not what gives you self-worth. The dependency on government programs fuels socialism and leftist beliefs. Since government is their god, let's talk about this more as conservative leaders. You know, our rules, our laws, our morals all come from our Judeo-Christian heritage. That's faith, that's God. A Couple of other things I wanna talk about. That's chapter one, that's really important and we need to do more of it. Even outside of our own little circles, we need to gently introduce this, this notion of freedom and religion and how they're related. Uh, chapter four, it's, it's actually my favorite chapter. Hard work is a virtue. <laughs> That's what it's called. A key part of the left's goals, um, you know, I don't know if you've read, AOC said that, you know, all Americans have to be provided with economic security for all who are unable or unwilling to work. Unwilling to work. It's unthinkable to conservatives. Hard work is central to the American dream and your personal development. You're gonna learn a lot in your first jobs when you're just starting out. 
Um, you make yourself very valuable in the, in the beginning by doing what needs doing. You're, you're probably not going to start out as a policy expert or be on Fox News with rare exceptions. You may be asked to do some grunt work, but if you're working for good people, they will recognize you are doing what's needed, and when a promotion opportunity opens up, those who work cheerfully, those who work hard, will likely be the ones selected to be hired and to be promoted. My first job at YAF was sitting at a front desk, answering the phone and assisting other staffers. And my father was concerned, that would be an understatement concern, uh, that I had studied to have a profession to be a teacher and I started out answering the phone and, and just being an assistant to people. But you know what? That job turned out to be a great place to learn who had the titles in YAF and who really made the decisions and what I had to do to get ahead. I did a lot more work than was assigned. I worked very hard and very long. I wrote some issue papers back in the 70s. We'd have issue papers like this. It was eight and a half by 11 folded. I did one on the Equal Rights Amendment. I did one on the uh, demonopolize the post office. I recorded a radio editorial on a local rock station. And soon I was promoted out of the position. Right out of college, even if you've been a leader on your campus, you have to work some in your job to make yourself professionally value, valuable. You work hard, you work long, and then you lift yourself to the position you want. Next, I want to mention reading, reading, read, 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 to grow your brains, to deepen your knowledge, and to force yourself to spend more time productively than on the seductive time eater known as social media. I recommend a few great books in How to Raise a Conservative Daughter. And I hope you, you are reading thoroughly to understand the history of our country and what makes America exceptional. It's not America's wealth. It's not the beautiful country we have and all the smart and healthy people we have. It's because in America, our rights come from God, not from government. And if you're a little wobbly on that idea, what makes America exceptional? Do some reading in the founding documents, if you haven't already. Look at the Declaration of Independence, the words, we are endowed by our creator, that's God, with certain unalienable rights. What does unalienable mean? It means impossible to be taken away. And think about President Obama. I don't know if you were old enough to remember him talking. He was in France, and he says, oh yeah, cool guy. I believe in American exceptionalism, just as I think the Brits believe in British exceptionalism, and the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. He didn't understand it in the least. But if you know about American exceptionalism and you talk about it to your friends and family who maybe haven't thought about it, it helps make people conservative. Finally, I want to mention chapter five. A woman's differences are her strengths. My grandmother, God rest her soul, she used to say on the issue of equal rights for men and women, why would any woman want to step down to equality with a man? She was a feisty babe, I miss her. <laughs> Most of us have, you know, you have left-wing women's study centers and courses at your school. They only teach left-wing views. You'll never or very rarely hear about conservative women there except to condescend and mock them. And they often teach that children are a burden and that hold you back in life. I mean, think about it. The breathtaking miracle of childbirth elevates you as women. Yet the left's propaganda teaches that men and women are just the same. That's just a lie. We see today the biological boys who feel like girls, biological men who feel like women, robbing girls and women of victories in sporting events where they're allowed to compete. It's unfair and it's wrong. There are clearly physical advantages to men. They have larger hearts, they have larger muscles, larger bones. And of course, most of the time, they're going to beat the girls in athletics. I mean, do we really want women to have to share the group showers and locker rooms with biological men? I always think of, God bless them, the women who've had sexual assaults, and they're supposed to stand in the shower with the men. In fact, at the Loose Center, we don't use the word gender. It's sex. 
because it promotes this left-wing agenda that your biological sex doesn't matter. The truth is you're born a male or a female, and that is your sex. And with true compassion for some very confused people, what you can do to change yourself doesn't ever change your sex. And more and more, we had a wonderful speaker uh, last week at Luce uh, talking about K to 12 and some of the things going on with the transgender movement and, and children. Surgery and hormone treatment on young children, in my opinion, is a modern form of child abuse because most kids who want to change their sex grow out of it by the time they're 18. There's been study after study showing that, if you just leave them alone. I mean, they're really medical experiments on, on vulnerable children. For sure, there are no differences between men and women's intelligence. At the Luce Center, our full-time staff and board are married. Many have sons. I have three sons. We love men, but we know that sometimes women can benefit from just being with other women, just like men need time with men. We don't have to be together all the time for everything. One area where there are some very clear physical differences is when it comes to physical responses to intimacy. And we have a little book. I don't know how many of you have seen it. They're not in your folders, but you can, you can go online and get it, or you can, uh, uh, you can call us and order. It's called The College Girl's Guide to Real Protection in a Hooked Up World. Sense and Sexuality. If you haven't seen this, please read it. Please keep yourself safe and informed by understanding there's a true difference, a physical difference between men and women when it comes to intimacy. And we're not the sex police at the Luce Center, but you need to understand the difference between men and women. It's, it's what mothers used to tell their daughters way back in the day when things were simpler. Um, and, you know, kids didn't need 12 years of sex ed. A 45-minute conversation usually would do the trick. But um, it's different today, I know. It's, it's a different world with the social media, the entertainment world, the, what's taught in the schools. But please be informed about this. Make very smart and intelligent decisions so you don't mess yourself up for the future. Sense and sexuality. Please read it. Ladies, you have so much ahead of you, rich, fulfilling, personal, and professional lives. I hope I've given you some things to think about and help you along the way, and I welcome any questions that you have. Thanks. Hi, my name is Florencia Mack. Um, I go to New Mexico State. And I was wondering, I mean, the thought of writing a book someday seems interesting, even if I have an accomplished life. Um, but it's like, I don't think I could physically write that much. So I'm wondering, you as somebody who's now written a book, did, was it something you always wanted to do? Are you a writer? Or is it just something that you were so passionate about you overcame not even writing that much? No, to be honest, it's not something I always wanted to do. I never would have imagined it. And really, it took me 28 years because you, the women like you who I've worked with over the years, the ones that taught me, that showed me what went on in your lives to make you turn out to be such graceful, intelligent women. And the combination of that, and we have wonderful supporters for our institute. Um, who worry a lot. Some of them are supporters because their daughters didn't turn out the way they had thought. So, um, you know, you're very kind. I appreciate it. it. It's an unbelievable amount of work. I had help. I had help from the staff. I had help from uh, editor. I had a lot of help. I had a wonderful publisher, Regnery, their conservative publisher. Um, there were times when I was totally overwhelmed with it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wouldn't say, oh, this is a piece of cake. Not at all. But I felt called to do it because I'd learned so much over the years that I thought I could share with people. Um, 28 years of the young woman, that's a lot of years. Yeah. So thank you for asking. Uh, not a piece of cake at all. Uh, to even just finding a publisher is, is, a, is a challenge. Oh, I can imagine. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Uh, 
Hi, um, my name is Mariana. I'm from Temple University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And my question is, what advice do you have for us when we have to deal with women in our lives that we're close to, like family members or really close friends who are on the opposite side of the mm -hmm. political spectrum than we are? Well, um, you want to stay friends, so you want to um, talk about things in a, in a, you know, you don't want to pound on them, probably. But sometimes you can pick an issue where you think you might have common ground with them um, and explore where they are, talk, talk it through slowly in a friendly sort of way. I wrote an article in Breitbart, I think it's in the folder, right? And it was really directed at parents, but it would fit for this too. It was three conversations you want to have with your children at the dinner table. I'm big for dinner tables. Have dinner and talk about these things for the time your kids are young. Um, and introduce those kind of subjects. Look at the article um, about why America is exceptional, uh, a couple things like that. Um, do they even know, do they know that in America that our rights are not from government, not from Joe Biden and Kamala, they're from God. And you know, the very words of, for example, the, um, the Second Amendment, the very words of that amendment say that um, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. We have that right, it's given to us, it's God given. Government, you shall not infringe it. We hear, we hear so much uh, where government just wants to take guns away. But I think that a lot of people, even well-meaning liberals and leftists, don't even know that. They don't know how important the role of God was in our founding document. Now, some of them may say, oh, well, we'll just change the founding documents. Good luck with that. But introducing them to that, um, talking about the differences between men and women, read the little book, read the little book, because intuitively, most people sort of figure this out. You know, when, when just, I'm just saying, kissing and hugging. What happens in women is there's this hormone, it's the same hormone that comes up when we nurse our babies, if you nurse your babies. And we bond and we fall in love, and men don't have that hormone. So it's a very different reaction with most men to physical intimacy. Introduce that concept. Um, you know, the differences between men and women. I mean, even the liberal and the left, some of them are horrified. And some of these feminists are horrified at having to share the showers and the toilets with men. So try to find some areas of common ground. I have a couple of friends, and um, I have one that is such a left winger, but she's good on life. <laughs> I don't know why. So you find the common ground and try to build out from that. Work at it. Hi, my name is Trinity, and I go to Patrick Henry College in Virginia. It's a very small, private, conservative Christian college. And a lot of us young women at that school have hopes and aspirations of going into either the political field or a legal profession, mm -hmm. even journalism sometimes. But we also have that desire to raise families and have a successful life as well. And you've had a long career in Washington, D.C. and doing political things. So what advice do you have for us who want to have that successful career in Washington, D.C. as conservative or even religious young women? It's a good question. And it differs for every woman. I, uh, we've had some lectures recently at Luce um, where there were a lot of recommendations that you know when you have your children, you drop out of the workforce. And that works. That works for some women. Um, a lot of it depends on, remember that most important thing you're going to decide in the next 50 years? Okay. Well, I married a fellow who, um, who really pulled his weight. Um, I have tremendous energy. Even at my age now, I do. Um, I was blessed with three incredibly healthy boys. My little girl, we lost her at three months in open heart. My mom and dad moved across the street when I had a two-year-old, um, uh, when, uh, when I had my second child. They were never the babysitters, but they watched the babysitters. I, we had live-in nannies when the kids were, were young. There's so many different factors. Um, some women, the first time they hold that baby, that's it. They do not want to leave the baby. And if you're able to do that economically, God bless you, enjoy it. That wasn't me. Um, 
I had four of them and I went back each time, but I had all these other conditions that really, really helped me. Um, and I had people that encouraged me. The notion was, and this is not a criticism of people who don't work, but if our women aren't out in the professional world, then it's dominated by Pelosi, by Kamala, by those types. Some women work out, they get jobs where it's part-time, they can work at home, that works well. You're probably not gonna run the show unless you're full-time, so it depends what you want. Um, I wanted to run the show. <laughs> but I, I'm not everybody. I'm, I'm a little different, maybe, in some ways. Um, my kids are so important in my life. Uh, they always have been. Every Sunday, they all come for dinner now. I cook. Sometimes I wonder if I didn't cook, would they come? But they do come. And uh, it's, it's a, and the question is answered by you and your husband and all these other factors. I mean, if you have sick babies, um, if you're not high energy, there's, there's different, if your husband doesn't do his share, okay? <laughs> From the very earliest time, my husband took the babies, rocked them, fed them, all that. He loved it. He just, that was just him. So pick a good husband and then sometimes you don't know until you have the baby. Are you still healthy? You know, what, what's going on professionally between the two of you? Um, it's, it's not a definitive answer, but you know, the feminists say, oh, forget the kids and husband, just do the career. Well, I certainly wouldn't say that, but the wonderful thing about being a conservative woman is that we have so many options, so many different ways you can do stuff. Um, so keep me posted what you do, okay? How are we on time, Julie? Um, one more? Okay. Hello, thank you for the wonderful speech. My name is Juliana Marsh. I'm a student at the University of Virginia. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more to how women can handle the smaller intimate actions by men in the workplace, you know, looking down the shirts or maybe a simple touch. Thank you. The, the smaller intimate actions meaning, I'm sorry, uh, rudeness, vulgarity. Um, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, mostly you don't want to put up with it. <laughs> you want to speak up. Um, I had three sons, and I gotta tell you, by the time they were all raised and out of the home, I actually came to laugh at adolescent boy humor. <laughs> and not disgustingly vulgar, but you know, boys have a different kind of humor than we do. And that, you know, the, some of that's okay, but I would never put up with vulgarity. I would never put up with condescension. Um, normally, a lot of guys, you just call them out once or twice, and that's it. Um, you do it politely, you, you tell them why you don't like it, you say, you know, made me very uncomfortable, uh, you make me not want to work here, whatever. Um, but, but don't be too strict, because they are different from us. Um, but you should not be made to feel uncomfortable in those kind of ways in a workplace. You can always go to the supervisor, you can go further, you can uh, go as far as you can, and you can always leave which is not ideal if you love your job. Um, but I would never stay in a place, like some of these women that work for Governor Cuomo, come on. He's grabbing at them, he's putting his hand up their shirts. I mean, he's a big superstar leftist, right? I would have left and written a story about it too. But you know, they're all thinking about their careers. They're, you're crazy to put up with that kind of thing. The grabbing. Now he said it's cultural. You know, I'm Italian. You know, we hug. Duh, duh, duh. Well, there is some more touching in some ethnicities. You know that. But he was disgusting, and he was uh, soliciting sex from people that work from him and reporters, and having a pretty state trooper assigned to him, and then grabbing at her. I mean, <laughs> it's hard to know in those kind of situations what to do other than leaving because you'd instantly be fired, and some of them were retaliated against when they complained about him. But in most situations, you can go up the ladder, you can go to a supervisor, um, and you can write about it to somebody, have it in writing, writing's always good, I'm a lawyer, you know, writing, write it down, what happened, who said what, um, try to get it fixed. Sometimes, though, you don't even have to do that. You just call them out, you put them in a corner, and you say, look, Joe, you just said da da da, that is so, embarrassing and offensive to me, and you may not realize it, but I would really like you to stop those kind of remarks to me. Sometimes that works.
My name is Callie Nix, and I go to North Carolina State University. And unlike Trinity here, I do not go to a small conservative college. I go to a quite large liberal college. Yeah. And so most of my friends are quite liberal leaning and believe a child is a burden, not a blessing. Many of them also think family values are inherently sexist mm. and not well received. Mm. And I've also noticed that they have higher rates of depression than my conservative friends who would waste their 20s on having a family and loving their children. Higher rates of what, say that again? Depression. Oh, yeah. Um, because in my opinion, I would deem that having a family and children are fulfilling right. and a very right. important part of your life. Right. And this rejection of family and children, not necessarily because maybe you're not a children's person, but because of a political ideology, seems very flawed to me. Right. So how would you go about I don't know the best way to word this. I don't normally ask questions. Um, but what would you recommend we do as their friends to support them and show them that family ideology is not sexist? In fact, it is empowering. Right. It is. I mean, that's a good question, uh, Esther, and you did, you did quite well. A strong, close family increases the odds of a stable, stable happy future for you and for your daughters. Family is the best defense against poverty and the best source of love and lifetime support. We, we tell moms and dads, use your marriage to show what a really loving relationship looks like because that's gonna be your daughter's model. Um, and if you're raising a daughter alone and it happens, sometimes life is messy and it happens, you can use a family first approach with relations, with aunts, uncles, uh, with other people, with relatives, church family. I mean, the family is such an important part of happiness to most people. And for most women, that includes children. Sometimes they can't have them for one reason or another. Um, but this notion of children holding you back, it's just, it's, those women, some of them, I know, I'm old enough, I know, suddenly they reach 40, they haven't married, they haven't had children, and they're in total despair. In fact, we have some supporters who support us because they heard about us and they thought, if only somebody had come to my school when I was in, in college and talked to me about the importance of having the loving family and, and children around you. Um, I think you just, you have to talk to them. Uh, it's chapter two of my book, if you read that. <laughs> it has a lot of good information and statistics on family. Uh, but family, I mean, families can be challenging. Mine is very challenging sometimes, but um, I can't imagine life without my husband, without my children, um, and how very gratifying and satisfying it is to work through the problems and challenges. And like I said, they all come for dinner on Sunday. What more could a grandmother ask for? <laughs> is, that a, is that a good answer? Thank you. Okay. Hello, my name is Sarah. I go to the College, College of Lake County in Illinois. Um, my question for you is, how do you do it all? How are you able to have a prestigious career and be a great mother and have a great family? Um, I work really hard, but um, there's give and take along the way. Um, I think it's one of the earlier questions I said, your husband is so key and if your mom and dad, if you get along with them and they live close, that's so key. And having healthy kids is so key. And working for good, smart people, conservatives or elsewise, who understand you, who want to help you, who don't want to hold you back, who aren't going to insult you with vulgarity, who appreciate what you do. Um, I mean, I've made mistakes along the way, no doubt about it, um, but I think that each person, each woman has to decide for herself. I mean, you're in college now, it's a wonderful time to explore different ideas, different subjects. Um, but as you get older, you're gonna have to make choices. And those choices are really key. So talk to people who love you, who care for you, who've been successful about how to do stuff. My model is not right for everybody. Um, people, some women wanna be six months with their new baby. 
I was okay with going back. I had enough help. I had other things going. But my model is not the one that all of you necessarily want to do. But it worked for me and my husband and our kids. Um, and I just feel blessed that things have worked out. I did work hard. I worked very hard. One of the things I always did, somebody told me this when I was about your age, don't expect success in everything. Work really hard, do your very best, and then when you are successful, it's like, yes! It's a wonderful thing. Um, it's not going to be handed to you. I mean, I worked for a few jerks along the way. Um, you work through it, and, uh, and you look for opportunities to move on or to move up in the organization. Um, having a best friend, husband, really helps as you're going along the way. And uh, my parents helped me a lot, too. My dad, when I left in the morning, he didn't say, have a nice day, or call me, or be safe. He said, get in there and fight. <laughs> he did. Every day as I left the house. But you know what? It's just its an attitude. Get in there and fight. Don't look to slough off. Don't look for easy. Do your best. Hi, my name is Kay, and I go to the University of Illinois. And my question is, what advice do you have for us women who are involved in like sororities, for example, um, where you're extremely outnumbered, at least at my campus, it's super liberal. And a lot of the other girls in my sorority um, feel free to push their opinions on everyone else. Mm -hmm. For example, like on our, our social media, we post a lot of things, and I'm like, that doesn't represent all of us. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I was just wondering, like, what types of, what advice would you give to us who are involved in? Well, maybe look for some activities that are um, somewhat more neutral. Like, YAF has a wonderful project, the 9-11 project. You put the flags in the ground, you know, you, you honor those who died in 9-11. Are they going to be opposed to that? Um, something like that, you know, you could get, get them in easily. We have um, a, a number of different activities we do. You know, a liberal woman who maybe, poor thing, has suffered a sexual assault, she might like one of our gun range uh, uh, events where you take six, eight girls to the gun range, you learn about gun safety. For some, it's the first time they've ever fired. Um, to broaden them, and you can talk about it that way. Uh, are they all pro-abortion? Uh, pro yeah, because um, sometimes people who maybe aren't sure one way or the other, you can get them to get involved in the March for Life that comes in, in January. Um, we put out a calendar every year called Great American Conservative. Oh, I think it's in your folder, isn't it? Um, and some of those women are uh, elected officials. Promote some conservative women to them. Have a local politician come in who maybe is not a real winger, but she's a conservative, and have her give a talk. So, you know, try through sort of gentle activities to, to reach them on different things. Some of those girls, when they go to work, not a lot of them, but, and they get the first paycheck and they see all the taxes that government takes out of it, they start to shift over. It's like, what is all this money out of my paycheck? I work so hard. Um, so there's some things you can try. Uh, sometimes you just, you can't get through them. So you're either going to be friends and not talk about that. I have some friends like that. We just don't talk politics at all. Um, and I've known them for many years. But most people, you can reach through to them on different issues in a, in a, in a gentler kind of way. Try that. Howdy. Um, hi, my name is Cassie May. Um, I, I'm going to give a little background. I grew up in an abusive home, so I was surrounded with the idea of like... A music home, did you say? I'm sorry. No, abusive home. Oh, I'm sorry. So, <laughs> okay. I um, was surrounded with the ideas that like feminism was this power and um, men were all bad and things mm -hmm. like that. And mm -hmm. um, not necessarily from my family, but from the outside, they're like, this yeah. can protect you from that. Yeah. And so a lot of times I struggled with my identity in that of like who I am because I was hearing these things like you are worthless, you are this, you are that. And so in my head, I'm like, am I worthless? Am I this? And it was being repeated back to myself. I was able to escape that when I became a born again Christian. And I just um, started remembering like I am who Christ says I am. 
and I'm just quoting scripture through that. But now I find myself coming to this place that um, being a conservative woman, but also wanting to be a gentle, kind woman, um, sometimes feels super confusing when I want to be gentle and I want to be kind, but I'm also bold and I say what I mean and I'm not going to lie to you and I, I'm going to stand up and I'm not just going to be all um, go lucky sometimes when there are serious issues. And so I'm dealing with some people that are like, oh, she's just, just so gentle and kind and we can do anything we want to her. And then the people that are like, when I stand up and they say, oh, she's mean. And I'm trying to be, okay, I am bold and fearless. I am not mean and I am gentle, but I am not stupid or soft. And um, just that identity of who we are as conservative women. I didn't know if you had ever dealt with the I want to be a woman who is kind and gentle and loving and motherly, but also I will speak up and I will stand up and that doesn't make me mean. And have you ever had to deal with that? Well, most of us are kind and gentle and motherly as conservatives. What I would suggest you do is look at some of the policy uh, recommendations of the left and how destructive it's been to women and families. For example, over the years, welfare policies where the mother got more money if there wasn't a father there. Um, just the whole dependency on government. That's not gentle and kind, that's wicked. <laughs> it's separating income from work. There's, there's generations of, of families of women who have no experience with work, they haven't seen it. Gentle and kind, a lot of conservative policy positions really are better for women than the liberal policy. So maybe take a look at it like that. I mean, women, service is an important thing that conservatives do, and I actually have a chapter on that as well. Um, giving to others. Well, conservatives, the polls show, we give more charitable donations by far than leftist families do. We're really giving. Most of us who are believers give to our church, and we give to many, many other charities. Um, and so teaching, teaching girls about giving and, and service, um, charity, I think that you know we are gentle and kind. I think that we don't always think about our policy positions in those terms. But I would ask you to look at them and uh, call me sometime if you want. We'll talk about that some more. But we're the kind ones. They're the ones that wreck families for decades now and, and, and terrible situations, I mean, defund the police in the inner cities. Really, is that kind? No, it's black people getting murdered, getting assaulted, getting raped. It's poor people, blacks on blacks. It's defund the police is the most unkind policy you could possibly have, not for us who live out in the suburbs or in the country, but for inner city families. So turn it around on them, yeah. okay? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. One more? Okay, last one. <laughs> oh, wow. Well. Hi. Hi. Um, my name's Piper. I go to school in Memphis, Tennessee, and I just wanted to say that I think you're extremely well spoken, and I really have loved listening to you. Oh, thank you. But I do have a lot of confusion about the first part of your speech mm -hmm. because I don't understand how saying that, like, in order to be a conservative, you have to be Christian. And I am Christian. No, I'm extremely not Christian, Christian, faith, Jewish, whatever. But doesn't that feel kind of like counterintuitive or judgmental? I don't understand how to get that message across without feeling like I'm, yeah. you know, like hitting at somebody or. Well, there's, there's two parts of it. The first is the self-worth that I talked about versus self-esteem. Self-worth is really, where does that come from? It doesn't come from your teacher telling you you're awesome. It's from knowing that God loves you and made you unique and special. That's religion. That's faith. Okay? And then the other part of the religion is understanding how our country was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. Our rights come from God. They don't come from government. We, uh, you know, we, we fought a war with the king in England. So you don't have to go to church to be a conservative. You don't have to. But those are two central concepts, your self-worth and our country's founding with the rights coming from God that if you don't have religious faith, it's a little hard to do. 
You see? I don't know. Do atheists have self-worth? That was the question. Well, where would it come from? Where, where would it come from if it doesn't come from God? That's self-esteem. How would you define self-worth? I beg your pardon? How would you define self-worth? Self-worth is a concept that, um, that, your, that your goodness, that your uniqueness um, in the world in, as an individual comes from a higher being, uh, our creator, our creator has given us these rights. Who's our creator? What are, they, what are they talking about? The Declaration of Independence. It's God. He gives us the rights and he gives us as individuals uh, the feeling that we have a worth just ourselves. We don't need, I don't need you to tell me I'm special. You don't need me. It's that God made us special and unique. And that's really different from self-esteem. Can an atheist feel that? I mean, I don't know how. I don't know how. They might feel good about themselves. I'm a really good atheist, but, you know, based on what? Um, we know, I know, as a, as a child of God, he made me special and unique. He made every single one of you. And that's different from, I feel really good about myself. 